So good morning. My name is Maur. And um, just before I begin my lecture, just to give you a short overview of where I'm coming from. That is once I've gotten this into my pocket more properly. Thank you. For those of you that don't know me, I'm an uh, old banker. Uh, not that old, but kind of old. And when I'm doing research, my train of thought often revolves around my banking experience and being ahead of the curve. Like in a chess match, I'm trying to see a few moves ahead of the match. And my lecture today revolves pretty much around that. Maybe in addition to my work, I've given quite a many lectures and written quite a bit about housing loans in Iceland and interest rates, the effects, why interest rates were so high in Iceland. So the lecture, interest rates in the interest of Icelanders, that is kind of the background for this lecture here. I'm going to begin by telling you a short story. And uh, the story may seem to be kind of just a so what story, but actually, well, hopefully, I hope it makes sense once I finalize my lecture. Here's a picture of Café Norden. I don't know how many people here know Café Norden. If you've been on Ströget or Stryget in, Ice, in uh, Copenhagen, this is, I think it's called Amaga Torques, just by Ilum, this place. And I was there in 207 with my wife and kids. I saw the menu, they had great super nachos there and big beer, oh, it's great being there. And I told my wife, let's go here, even with the kids. It's so cheap here. This is the most expensive spot in Denmark. And we decided to go there, and the place was filled with Icelanders. You could just hear more, almost more Icelandic than Danish inside that place. And I told my wife, you know, this ain't going to last. There are too many Icelanders here. The Icelandic kroner is way too, well, stuff abroad is way too cheap. And lo and behold, the next year, 208, we were back there. And the Icelandic kroner, which a year ago had cost 11 kroners, cost something around 15 kroners. We went there once. I heard some Icelanders, no, there were not that quite many Icelanders there. And then in 209, I went back again. I was like over the twist, looking through the window, saw the menu, walked out again. I didn't hear any Icelandic, not at all. And that pretty much relates to this story. This is how much each Danish kroner cost in Icelandic kroners. Here, this is when I was first there. Here you had half of Iceland basically at Café Norten, having super nachos and beer. And not quite so many here in 208. And here you had hardly any Icelanders. This is simply the foreign exchange rate, the official foreign exchange rate. If you take inflation into account, the picture is somewhat dimmer because inflation in Denmark means that you needed more Danish kronos to buy each thing in Denmark. But there's a big but in this, and that is that wages since 2008 they've been rising quite a big deal in Iceland. The, uh, according to this index here, the average wage in Iceland in January 2007 was around 310. It's quickly approaching 600 here. So wages in Iceland during this period on average have almost doubled the value. So what I did was I took into account inflation in Denmark and wages in Iceland. And here you can see things became brutally expensive for Icelanders here around 2010. But since then, the krona has been appreciating. Inflation has been very benign in Denmark. And 
uh, wages in Iceland have been skyrocketing. So we're back into 207 Kaffin North and uh, how should I put it? The atmosphere here. And I really, really want to go back to Cafe Norton and have some Supernaturals and some big beer, really. And actually, I know, were you were there last week, weren't you? Or are you going back again? Yeah. Yeah, please go to Cafe Norton and take a picture, OK? And do some investigation. I would be interested to see if we have some Icelanders there back again. Okay, this sounds like a, just a sweet little story, and it kind of is, but it's related to another subject that is somewhat much more drier. You might have a few beers to really enjoy it. It's called the Impossible Trinity. And this is a theory, economic theory, that you can have, it's kind of, if you remember the meatloaf song, two out of three ain't bad. If you have problems, remember this theory. Think about that song. You don't have to sing it, but it, yeah, you can sing parts of it. The impossible trinity states that you can only pick two out of three corners, one within the economy. That is, you can have free flow of capital, you can have a stable exchange rate, but not an independent monetary policy. Meaning that if you have free flow of capital and a stable exchange rate, meaning that the exchange rate remains the same towards another big currency or a basket of currencies, you cannot have an independent monetary policy. Because if you have the exchange rate fixed, you have a free flow of capital, you must sacrifice the independent monetary policy. If you do not, Interest rates, for example, if interest rates were higher here than the rest of the world, you would have capital inflows coming in like crazy until you would need to adjust the currency level. And if interest rates are lower than the rest of the world, no one would want to save, like say in Iceland, no one would want to save money here if you can get higher interest rates abroad. So the central bank can balance it by, at, by selling some foreign currency until one day the foreign currency reserves drives up. I hope this makes sense to most of you. And by the same token, if you have an independent monetary policy and stable exchange rate, you cannot have a free flow of capital. It's two out of three. Just remember that Meat Love song. Use your Spotify if you've forgotten it or do not even know it. Some people might not know it. Everyone over 40 knows it in Iceland, believe me. So this impossible trinity was developed during the 1960s. It's sometimes called the Montel Fleming uh, trinity because two guys, Montel and Fleming, wrote essays. But it didn't uh, receive that much attention. It wasn't until the 1970s that it began uh, receiving attention. And basically, that was because, A, until 1970, or was it 71, 71, uh, following World War II, countries had a fixed currency between them. Long story, uh, between World War I and World War II, currency, there were basically currency wars in Europe. But following World War II, there was a decision made to keep the currency staple. So they locked it to the dollar, which in turn was locked to the golden standard or golden foot. Hence, talking about the impossible trinity didn't make that much sense because everyone were, uh, there, was, there was not that much fluctuation going on. And also, the uh, increase in free flow between markets was not nearly as much as once the currency uh, gold standard broke down. So this theory began gaining some ground. Some countries have chosen to ignore it. Asia 
chose to ignore it. So during the 1990s, early capital flowed into some Asian countries. The industry was booming and newspapers talking about the Asian tigers. It ended badly. Let's just put it at that. Argentina had a similar experience and uh, everything went bust in 201. And some people might remember uh, Nico who worked here at RU from Argentina. He was still talking about this 15 years later. Talk about people that are still talking about currency. I worked with Swedes in 210. They were still talking about the banking crisis in 1990. Uh, both Finland and Sweden tried to uh, have their cake and eat it, and they wound up having to unpack their currencies. If I remember correctly, the Finnish mark, uh, marka, was depreciated uh, by, I think it was 40%. It was a major swing. <clears throat> Iceland tried to have a big slice of that cake, have it and eat it. Here in 201, Icelanders set the Icelandic kroner floating and decided to uh, concentrate on keeping inflation intact. And the Icelandic kroner actually became uh, appreciated for a while uh, until things kind of went bust here. So here it cost 120 kroners on average buying some foreign currency. A year later, it cost about twice as much. So, and this is actually one book that I actually even see two people, at least here, that will be reading this book next semester that talks about financial crashes, uh, money going in and out of an, an economy, for example, because countries have violated the impossible trinity. So if we just go through these three figures here, we have in Iceland, we've had a free flow of capital actually much shorter than most people think. Because in 1930, um, the old Íslandsbanki went bankrupt and Búnaðarbanki, the agricultural bank was established and currency controls were set. <laughs> And they were intact until 1995, when Iceland became part of the EEA, uh, European, I can never remember, European Economic Association, if I remember correctly. And Icelanders were, were kind of forced to allow the free flow of capital. It lasted only 13 years. So in 2007, a person could walk into a bank, ask for dollars worth 50 million Icelandic kroners and would get it. Um, during the fall of 2008, I saw this firsthand. A person asked for five for dollars to pay a subscription, to renew a subscription of a magazine for $5,000, uh, 5,000 kroners. I'm not joking, the answer was no. So there were pretty restricted currency controls and they, little by little they would be lifting and in 2016 they're still here but 2017 they'll be lifted but just kind of. So one could say that close to half of that corner has been lifted because the Central Bank of Iceland has powers to lock in capital which means that this prevents, okay, I should probably put this in parentheses. It prevents, to a certain degree, money going in and out of a country. So it is like a lock. Uh, it's a lock uh, from hot money going in and out of a system, uh, but it's not known how effective that lock is. So mostly there are no capital controls, but one could say that um, 
there is, we have some capital controls, but for the average person, we do not feel it. The exchange rate in Iceland, if we look at the exchange rate, it has hardly passed anyone that tourism is having a major effect in Iceland. So the central bank that just only a few years ago was basically praying and paying people a premium to give us some foreign exchange. Today, it is flushing into Iceland. So uh, the central bank really has, it is buying capital for an exchange so quickly that just within a few months, it is now approximately 40% of Iceland's GDP. Actually, tourism now is expected to be close to 30% of Iceland's GDP this year. So it's maybe not surprising that the currency, the, the reserves are just filling up. So we still have a, a floating Icelandic kroner, but we have an opportunity maybe now to uh, fix it and set it at a level where we could even make it a bit less stronger to other currencies. This is why I was giving you this Café Nord then example in the beginning. So discount rates, that's the third part of the triangle. So Iceland versus the world. Discount rates in Iceland, are their main aim has been since 2001 to fight inflation. One way to do it was to appreciate or depreciate the Icelandic kroner. And as you saw on the slide, a few slides back, it actually, the kroner remained very stable. But Iceland violated this impossible trinity with disastrous effects. So if we're going to keep discount rates, the discount rate independent, we would need to have massive capital controls. And we will basically need to abolish them in all but the name. Capital controls are hard to follow. Even the central bank admitted so. They might not do it today. Anyone here from the central bank? Okay, I don't see it. I don't know if that person would raise her hand, but anyways. Um, even, for example, Gilvi Soweka had a public lecture about why um, the discount rate was so high for a while following the crash when Icelanders really, really did need it the discount rate to go lower. And his answer was that despite the capital controls, there was so much money still seeping out of the system that the central bank deemed it necessary to keep the discount rate high so foreigners would have an incentive to just remain with the money within Iceland. Here we have the discount rate in Iceland, current one. It may actually change tomorrow. Many expect it to change somewhat. But as is, it's 525. The inflation rate in Iceland is 1.8. That means the real discount rate, that is the nominal rate above inflation, is 3.4%. This is really unheard of. The discount rate in the States now is 1%. Inflation is 1.5%. It is really close to just being the same as inflation here in the States. The historic, re, historic, here, historical real discount rate is a tad less than 1%. Um, I took my calculations, said it was around 0.9%. Uh, if you look at the discount rate in the Eurozone, it's base, it is actually below inflation, but um, 
the difference are really within um, um, the difference are so small that there's nothing to write home about in that regards. So one could ask, com comparing to this, or the re is the real discount rate in Iceland too high? And yes, one could say that if you would have the same discount rates here as abroad. And I'm, then I'm talking about the real discount rates. But Iceland has the GDP growth is more than in other nations. And it is actually similar to the historical GDP growth in the US and Europe. So depending on if we're going to have a soft currency exchange or a uh, hard one, if we would have a softer one, we should be looking at something that uh, is closer to the historic um, uh, premium to inflation for discount rates. Discount uh, inflation today in Iceland is 1.8% plus 0.9. It should be, according to my point of view, 2.7, which is 2.5% less than the current discount rate. If, we'll, if Icelanders are ever, ever going to fix the Icelandic kroner to some foreign currency, the time is now to do it. And most Icelanders can definitely uh, assign to that that we cannot afford a currency that is volatile. And anyone who has lived in Iceland for the last seven, eight years have been hearing people saying we cannot have capital controls, we cannot have them. So we do, we, they are becoming free next year, but one could say that that is only half of the corner um, of the triangle because there are tools to dampen the flow. <laughs> So we cannot afford having two of the above, that is, cannot afford not having them. So one could say that we have already 1.5, one, uh, one, one and a half of those two corners covered. So whilst interest rates do not have to be exactly according to these, um, this hypothesis like the world, they need to begin looking much more like interest rates in the world. The effect, finally, the effect would be that interest rates in Iceland would become lower. What would matter mostly for most Icelanders is that uh, interest rates for mortgage loans would go down dramatically. People are talking about index loans and not uh, talking badly about how index lo loans are for the Icelandic households. The real enemy, in my view, and everyone agrees with me after hearing my lectures, I've gave it to students of Catherine who can attest to that, is that that is the real enemy. And my guess would be the mortgage real rates, they would go down from 3.5% down to 1.5%. And what I say usually to people is, if you have an index loan, it's really not a loan. It's more like a rental fee because you pay so little of that loan back annually. So it's almost like if, let's say, if you own 50% of your house and you're paying uh, the rest of it is financed with a loan, you're renting that, house, that place. This number means that the rental fee is going down by half. There are other effects, and here is, this is my consumer-friendly persona talking here. The investor in me says, if this does happen, and Vidres now, for example, uh, is someone from Vidres here? Okay, thank you. They're kind of busy these days, you might know about it, there's stuff going on in society. Um, but they, for example, want to have, um, if their ideas about fixing the kroner, this would have major effects on the Icelandic economy. 
it would increase real estate prices quite a lot. And uh, the bond market, the value of long-term bonds and stocks would also skyrocket. That's the investment banker in me talking. But government policies would have to be very economically prudent, meaning that in good times like these, the government would have to set money aside, not only pay down debt, it would need to set money aside. So when uh, the economy slows down at some point, there will be money to invest in infrastructure and long-term projects, something that unfortunately did, was not in place in 2009 and 2010. Okay, that's still two minutes of your time. Thanks, I'm done. All right, thank you.